Uh, I'm Lucy Rica. I'm the executive director of the Center on the Legal Profession here at the law school. Um, and we are really pleased to present this panel today, Implementing Innovation, the Challenges to Changing Big Law. Um, we are so thrilled to welcome Stephen Poor, who is um, a partner and the chair of Safarth Shaw um, in Chicago. Um, under Steve's leadership of Safarth, they've really been one of the few firms that has dramatically embraced um, innovation internally and changing the way they provide legal services to their clients. Um, they have applied Six Sigma and Lean methodologies to their practice. They've been brought in a bunch of, um, of outside experts in process and, and um, project methodology. And they've really been recognized for this from uh, corporate and other groups across the field. So um, Mr. Poor was named the 2011 Legal Innovator of the Year by the Financial Times in recognition of his work. Um, we, we are going to structure this such that Ron and Thomas are going to present their paper first. Uh, some of you might have had a chance to take a look at the link. They'll give you a little background on it. Um, Ron Dolan is a fellow with our center. And he has a background in math and physics. He's an engineer by training. And after he um, spent some time at Google, he decided to go back to law school and apply his engineering expertise into the field of law. Um, he's been a fellow with us for a couple of years. And during that time, he's focused really on this question of how how we can actually bring innovation to the practice of law, particularly to the corporate practice. Um, and this paper is, is kind of, in some ways, a culmination of what Ron has been working on over the past couple of years. And he's been lucky enough to work on it with Thomas Bewley, who many of you know. He's a second year student here at the law school, JD MBA. He heads over to the business school next year. Um, and we're sorry to see him go. Thomas went to Duke undergrad, and he will be at McKinsey this summer, so hopefully applying some of his work in the consulting field. Um, so what we're going to do is have Thomas and Ron present their paper first, um, and then Stephen's going to comment on it, and that should lead pretty easily into a discussion. We'd like all of you to be a part of that discussion. Um, please come to the microphones uh, in either aisle if you'd like to ask questions. All right, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, well, let's just go through. Uh, right, I, I had spent some time early on with. Uh, here looking at technology in law, computer science PhD, and trying to figure out why law was not really picking up a lot of the technology that seemed to be out there. And you know, if you compare with like medical informatics, et cetera, what's up? And it's actually been quite a lot of work to look at uh, some of these issues. But let me go through this. Um, that is, um, I don't know if you guys have had venture capital. That's uh, broad-weighted anti-dilution formula when you have down-round financing so that when a startup is worth less currently than it was worth the last time it got financing. And so the new people are right or they're getting shares for less than the old people. <laughs> hi, hi, Margaret. And uh, <laughs> how do you make it fair to the people that had put money in before based on how much they put in and all that? So When I saw that, I, I saw a formula and I thought that was kind of interesting. And so I reshuffled it around and then I did that with it. And I think part of the issue is the mindset that we bring as lawyers coming to law. It's hard to explain, but it's more about that. And the engineer kind of is looking at the structure of the information a lot. And the lawyer's looking at the content. But the structure is the way that we reformulate how we do things. So that's why we look at things like you know process reengineering or uh, how the data is moving around and looking at informatics perspectives. Well, that's, again, common in medicine now. We're only beginning to see that rolling out more commonly in law. Uh, just one example, legal research. If you do go to Google image search and you put in legal research, that's what you get. Not surprisingly, and I, I, I'm guessing that very few, well, certainly not the students, are doing this. but. When you know you see the movies and they're in the library and they're looking through the books, then they have to go to the Shepherd thing, which was a great invention that you could see who's referencing the case that you think is so important and all that. So that's what it was. Then it became now that's reasonably modern. That's that's a recent query from Westlaw. Next, it's still a little old school, but and, and the, here we're looking at campaign finance, and that's certainly better than the book. Uh, and now we. And you see, like, the first result is not a Supreme Court. I don't know how they're doing their ranking. 
And then we have Google Scholar, which is doing stuff all for free. It's online, it's cloud-based, blah, blah, blah. And you can see those cases. And then finally, like I'll just give the last example is Ravel, <clears throat> where not only is the ranking important, but you start looking at the citation structure prior, for future, and then <clears throat> trying to move towards things like which of those are you know consistent, which ones are contradictory, and all that. So we try to get some of the link structure information visually to you quickly so that you can see 75 cases in one view and have it really tell you where you need to focus your work on, right? Very quickly, efficiently. Um, they don't have full case coverage. And so part of the issue that we get to with law firms or the, law, the legal system in general is why, is why are they being held up from doing this? And so the, the status quo is not really amenable to getting this new stuff rolled out and the innovative techniques that we would love to see that would transform things. What are all these barriers? And <laughs> that's part of what we were looking at. But there is a similar trends in terms of the capabilities across all legal work. Uh, I think Seifarth would be able, will tell us that they're doing quite a lot of many of this. So if that's all possible, what are the reasons that it's not happening? And just briefly that we see, uh, I mean, what are the problems? So 80% of people that can't afford legal help don't get any. They're, they're turned away. Um, we have the middle class market, if you talk to LegalZoom, about the billions and billions of dollars that have been sitting on the table because people want to spend a few hundred dollars, maybe it's 500 for an uh, undisputed divorce, rather than having to go spend $5,000 or something. Right? So we're starting to see that, but then they're up against issues around like un unauthorized practice of law, that they can't help you pick your form, stuff like that. <clears throat> Corporate clients uh, arguably are paying quite a lot for the work that they're getting, and they want to address that. We'll talk more about that. Uh, underemployed lawyers, when people are needing help, there's a structural problem right, in the legal system. I'm guessing you've seen some of these things before. Um, and associates clearly are spending time, or in the past have spent quite a lot of time on things that they hate. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I think that that's addressable. And then finally, like I said, the technology adoption is slow. So you want to take this? You want this for me? Go for it. Okay. Um, it's not a single problem. It's, uh, you know, why legal aid clinics don't pick up technology is, from, is different from why courts don't or from why big law has hesitated. Uh, it's an ecosystem that has devol evolved around inefficiency, focusing on some form of notion of quality and comprehensiveness, and uh, it, it's not really, yeah, so the reason that the courts are having a lot of hard time, like I say, very different than legal aid, et cetera, um, and there hasn't been a lot of incentive. So. And then I think that lawyers, bring, you know, law students, when they're, they're selecting law, the, the personality types typically that have come into law have really focused a lot on, as we would think, of risk aversion and predictability. And part of the issue is that predictability in the substantive law is then mapping into the same old, same old with the processing in law. And those are separate. In other words, we, we want outcome predictability, but we don't necessarily want to stop doing new ways of getting to a result. Um, there hasn't been a lot of accountability. We'll look at that. Then the self-regulating guild, <coughs> the way that uh, you know, telling LegalZoom that they're up against unauthorized practice of law, or um, like you know, Washington has rolled out these triple LTs that these legal aid people basically like um, uh, nurse practitioner equivalent. And the bars having fought this because they're afraid that they'll lose money and can't see the business model that allows that to be a pipeline into the law firm. So we'll see how that rolls out. Um, wait, it's always the right time to wait. It's been a supply-driven market. So now we're going to look at innovators. I'm going to let Thomas take it from there. Yeah, so what Ron and I were trying to do was see uh, how closely, if at all, 
uh, Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma Framework maps onto big law uh, and what lessons big law could learn from that. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, uh, in the late 90s, Clayton Christensen, who was a consultant turned PhD uh, in management and then HBS professor, uh, came up with this Innovator's Dilemma Framework uh, where he said there are, uh, technology can serve two purposes. It can either be disruptive or, or it can be sustaining. Uh, and sustaining technology is going to improve existing products uh, and established products in the marketplace. And it's going to improve them along the performance metrics that are valued by the mainstream customers. Uh, disruptive innovation, on the other hand, uh, often leads to worse products at first, uh, especially along current performance metrics, uh, but it either taps into a new customer base or it addresses uh, a fringe component of the marketplace, uh, gets a toehold there, and then can improve its quality over time uh, and start going up the, uh, up the value curve. Uh, the disruption then occurs in that, that last step where uh, after uh, incumbents um, sacrifice the low end of the value curve and the low margin work, uh, the disruptor who is now has a toehold can improve the quality of the product uh, and chase the incumbent up the value curve uh, and start delivering products to new customers. So we wanted to see how this applied to law. Uh, one of the main features of, of the disruptive innovation framework is going to be the values, processes, and resources uh, that are inherent in a firm. Uh, so just to give you an example of, of disruptive versus sustaining, uh, if you look at the camera industry in the last 10, 15, 20 years, uh, 15 years ago, a, a sustaining technology would have been improvement in the lens quality or um, uh, ability to tinker with shutter speed or aperture. Uh, it's going to lead to higher quality photos. Uh, you could even have higher quality film that's going to deliver higher quality photos. Uh, well, when digital cameras first came out, uh, they actually took very bad photos, uh, but they gave people the ability to immediately review a photo they took. Uh, gave them the ability to select which photos they brought to uh, a camera shop to be developed, uh, and it also allowed them to store them digitally rather than in photo albums. Uh, so it created new performance metrics that then became valuable to a certain set of consumers uh, and allowed over time for digital cameras to improve, uh, improve and eventually become equivalent, if not better than, uh, the regular analog counterparts. So the values, processes, and resources of firms can really affect their ability to innovate. Uh, and we wanted to look at, uh, at that with a little bit of law. Uh, and looking at the, the big law market right now, uh, it's, it, it kind of relies on its agility and opacity uh, to, to serve clients. Uh, when a client comes to a big law firm, uh, it's because they need the either uh, you know, staff augmentation or uh, for capacity reasons, or they need expertise in something. Uh, but there, there's a little bit of the traditional model of big law knows is the expert, and a non-expert is coming uh, is coming asking for that for that information. There's also the uh, the issue of why law firms exist in their in their partnership structure, uh, and one of the academic. Uh, justifications for it is a reputational bonding, uh, that there's an information asymmetry between a purchaser of uh, legal services and a provider of legal services. Uh, so how does a company know if the law, uh, law firm it's hiring is good? Uh, it relies on prestige or proxy for, uh, for rankings. Uh, one way for the, the, the firm to do that is uh, it's bonding itself in a partnership model where originally everyone was um, liable for each other's, uh, uh, each other's debts. Uh, and they were very selective about who they brought into firms, uh, recruiting from the top schools, and kind of and the top schools are recruiting from you know a certain LSAT and GPA pool, uh, and there was a certain selection process uh, that ensured quality, uh, but the quality was by proxy. It was just a, a reputational issue. So now we have uh, a few of the external pressures on big law. Uh, one of the big, big things is the, uh, the agility and opacity argument uh, is not nearly as strong now as it was 20 years ago uh, with the rise of in-house counsel. Uh, consumers of legal services uh, are much smarter. Uh, there are in-house departments uh, that are you know, entirely from big law trained uh, associates and partners. Uh, so they're much more, uh, much more informed customers. Uh, and then we also have new entrants into this. Uh, the, the two types of uh, disruptive technologies could be, uh, like I said, attacking the low end of the market uh, or attacking non-consumption. Uh, on the low end of the market, you have things like legal Zoom or uh, legal process outsourcing uh, and getting at some of that low margin work. So it'll be a question of how big law responds to that. Uh, and then as Ron highlighted, the non-consumption, uh, you know, the, the market could be ripe for that based on the access to justice issues that Ron mentioned. 80% uh, of people who can't afford legal services don't get them. Uh, and that's becoming increasingly, increasingly uh, uh, unconscionable in the ABA's eyes. 
uh, and might be a, a little bit more ripe for, for new entrants. Okay, so we'll hear from uh, Seifarth on this, but I think that some of the values that are coming in in terms of uh, what, what law firms have to accommodate are things, and you see this across the legal spectrum, so some of the stuff because the inefficiencies just kind of dominate no matter what part of the legal system, you see a lot of the similar problems. So unbundling, for example, uh, is useful both for a consumer to take on, go to a lawyer for this one piece and then I'll, you know, I'll take care of the rest of that. But uh, in-house is doing something similar, so they might farm out e-discovery while before they might have just gone to one law firm and said just take care of this litigation and now uh, e-discovery is going to a separate company and then that's going to be handed off. So that, but that's a huge chunk of billing there. Um, that unbundling <clears throat> is taking away some of what was uh, cash cow. It's a little bit of a problem. Um, it's, uh, they want systematized work where possible, so <clears throat> where things are being done over and over and over, we don't want to keep doing this as custom work. Um, efficiency is, is mat matters now. I don't know if efficiency really was front and center in the minds of the client um, 20 years ago. And now what we see is met like this metric-based ROI, law firm uh, in-house is now being held to account for being just another cost center at large companies. And in order for them to measure the ROI, they have to measure the quality because they're not willing to punt on the quality. So for example, if, if you map that out to like department stores and when do you need to go to, let's say, a Nordstrom versus when do you, or what kind of car do you want to buy, and it's, it's stratified. And we don't see that kind of clear stratification in legal service delivery yet. And part of that is quality, being able to measure this. So if, if Google's going to one law firm and that, that firm wins and they go to another one and they lose, that's not a sufficient way of measuring total return on investment or the, the quality of the work because you can't run the same case through multiple venues, right? Um, so quality over cost as a measure requires measuring quality. So that's my, that's my kick on that one. Let's see. This was the, what we kind of came to. Do you want to talk about this? Uh, sure. So, you know, one of the things we've uh, we discussed is how much does the business model uh, of a law firm need to change? Uh, Whether they need to be looking at uh, reorganizing the the people they have, uh, looking at new uh, new markets. Uh, whether it's working with consulting with in-house departments and helping build out in-house departments, uh, or moving towards more of a project management and uh, uh, and legal technologist role. Uh, and, and Safarth has, do, has done this with the uh, with Safarth Lean and, and getting into a little bit more of the process uh, and product and project management. And we're also looking at the the function yeah, of big that one. Yeah. Sure. I'll do that one. Yeah, and, and the function of big law and society. Uh, we think it's still the, there are these uh, protectionist uh, issues we can look at, uh, but it's important to realize the the function the firm serves. Uh, it's still going to uh, be a better use of expertise to house that. Uh, in, in a firm model rather than bring it in-house entirely. Uh, you know, there are going to be companies that do a significant amount of M&A, uh, but staffing in a, a full M&A department inside a company uh, that can handle all the transactions might not be efficient if there's a downturn in the market and there's fewer acquisitions. So housing lawyers as, a, as an external model in, an, in uh, and a kind of amalgamation of expertise in different areas uh, is still going to be valuable. Uh, and looking at the, the change in model, it might be a little bit more of a pushback to a, a one-stop shop of ability to serve clients uh, across the globe uh, in, uh, in a wide, area, a wide array of areas, uh, or looking at some that have gone more towards the boutique route and only being good, uh, specializing in patent litigation, for example. Uh, so looking at how these different shifts in business model uh, are, are impacted by uh, the disruption that could be there. And part of the issue that, that we were trying to get at is when in Innovator's Dilemma, a lot of the incumbents end up failing. And, and we were just trying to figure out whether that's what we're looking at with big law. And the conclusion is it just doesn't seem likely. Because of what's being delivered is coming from the heads of the lawyers, because uh, there's an efficiency of pooling the, expertise, the experts together at a firm. It's just that right now it's so inefficient that it's cost effective for the client to move things in-house. At a certain point, it just doesn't make sense anymore as law firms embrace efficiency, as they start taking on values that are being pushed by some of the clients and the, and the market forces, it still makes sense to pool things within a big law firm 
because they're going to get better pricing with vendors, for example. That's because you'll utilize that resource of the expert better because it's, it makes more sense for them to go client to client rather than just be sitting in-house working with that. So the conclusion that we were reaching was simply that innovator's dilemma is, is not quite what's going on in big law. And it, there's a lot of disruption, but the disruption is really about the, some of those values that big law has managed to adopt but aren't really central to their purpose. And what's central to their purpose is bringing that expertise forward. So they, once they start doing that more efficiently, right? There's just there's no reason for big law to go away, as far as as far as we can see. Right. So the, the stuff that we just talked about, and I think we'll hear more, uh, is creating new markets, increasing efficiency across the spectrum, even for the custom work. You can do custom work much more efficient, efficiently. Uh, in a, incentivizing innovation at the firm and, uh, again, standardizing the quality metrics. And that, that last part is just some of the stuff that we're trying to see in, in terms of training and law schools, et cetera, to get legal technologists trained, getting more career paths going, et cetera, to help move that. That's it. Uh, that one's just for fun. Uh, I don't think we'll get to that now, but uh, when I talk to computer science departments, <coughs> Et cetera. I just want the engineers to see that there's tons of really interesting engineering work in law that because that's what they're motivated by, right? It's it's the cool plot, it's it's the natural language processing, it's it's all kinds of stuff. There we go. Thanks. I'm going to stand. I'm a bit of a free-range speaker, so uh, it's a little easier if I kind of I kind of wander around. Uh, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Thomas. Your I think the paper is really fascinating stuff, uh, and I assume all of you've read it. If you haven't, you should. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our journey first, and then talk a little bit about some of the things we see happening out in the marketplace. Uh, as I, as uh, as Lucy sort of set up. We're a firm of about 800 lawyers. We're in four countries. Um, most of our presence is here in the States. Uh, we've been on a journey for a very long time, it feels like a very long time, um, to try to transform the way we think about the practice and the delivery of legal services. It's, a, it's an effort now to redesign <coughs> the service delivery mechanisms to do some of the things Ron and Thomas have been talking about in their paper. Uh, so we started uh, experimenting with a number of different things and about 10 years ago settled on uh, essentially Lean Six Sigma as a way to begin to think about the delivery of services. Um, that's been a, a journey that I wouldn't describe as linear. I would describe it as sort of not circular either. Either You move forward, you don't necessarily move um, uh, backwards. Um, but we've learned a lot along the way. And where we are now, um, as Lucy pointed out, we're consistently recognized as one of the world's most innovative law firms, which I'm not sure how much that says in our industry that's a tremendously non-innovative industry, but, but we'll take it. It's all good. Um, uh, we've got process engineers who work for us. We have legal technologists. We have project managers. We have system engineers. Uh, we've got a consulting arm of about 35 people that works on legal department transformations as well as the support and re-engineering of our own practices. Uh, so we do things a little bit differently than, than virtually any other firm, and we've learned a lot by doing it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Ron Thomas have sort of studied this and looked at it from an academic uh, perspective. Um, I don't bring an academic perspective. Um, I bring battle scars from having to exist in a world of lawyers for a very long period of time. Uh, you know, when Ron put up the slide about the really old way of doing research, the really old way, thank you for saying that, Ron. Ron. I'm looking at go, that's the way I used to do it. What? what, what, what? I used to pull my horse up in front of the law library and get off and read the books. You know, it's all good, okay? Uh, but I think the perspective I'm going to try to bring is sort of innovation in the wild. What's, what's it out there in the wilderness as, as we're trying to navigate this path, as we're trying to find uh, a way forward? And so I'm going to share some thoughts on that and then before the dialogue. So one of the things we see out there is this disconnect, right? This dissonance in the marketplace because Everywhere you go, somebody's talking about innovation. Somebody's talking about disruption. Somebody's talking about, oh, my God, what's happening in legal industry? The death of big law. It's all, it's all the rage. 
And yet we see this dissonance happening in the real world. And I th I'm sure as, as Ron and Thomas have studied it, they've seen the same thing. So Altman Wild, for example, did a study. They do one every year. And if you don't look at it, you should, because it's got some really interesting data and stuff associated with it. They've done it over a number of years, so it gives you uh, a continuum of data. 93%, most recent, of law firm leaders, and that would be people like me, I suppose, believe that practice efficiency is a permanent trend. OK, that's pretty cool. All right, we're all going to do what Ron says we should do. Well, 37% identified uh, that they're changing their strategic approach to drive more efficiency. So 93% say it's a permanent trend, and 37% are doing something about it. And I'm willing to bet that 37% isn't really 37%. I bet it's lower than that. But you know, it's a survey, and you know, there you go. You can't read the number up there, I don't think. But 63%, when asked of firm leaders, when said, "Why aren't they doing more to change their service delivery model?" 63% say clients aren't asking for it. Okay. And yet, 1.1 billion dollars in spend last year got moved from outside law firms into in-house. That's addition of 5.8 billion the year before. So the purchasers may not be using their words to say change. And you think about it, why are they going to say to me, as a leader of a law firm, you just need to change the way you're doing business, and oh my god, there's a lot more money we're going to give you. They're not going to say that, right? They're speaking loudly with their money. Okay? As Ron so rightly pointed out, we've moved into a demand-driven world. So from our perspective, as we look at what's going on in the market, one of the things we think needs to happen is we need to look outside in. Now, what do we mean by that? Okay, we're, it, it goes to the demand-driven point Ron and Thomas are talking about. As lawyers, every law firm says we're client-focused. We have great client service. Oh, my God. God, we'd run away with our clients if they would let us do it, right? <laughs> Everybody says that. And there's some validity to it, OK? It's great, OK? In the traditional sense, we're a service industry. We need to serve our clients. But when we talk about outside in, we mean something more, we mean something deeper and more profound than just simply being good client service people. We mean understanding the business drivers that the underlying business, the underlying consumer of services needs to have, the outcomes they need, how we can map our services to deliver an outcome-based solution set as opposed to an effort-based solution set, efforts being measured typically by hours. Right? So how do we move? So how do we really look at it? So let's take that microscope, let's turn the prism, and let's look at what we see going on in the marketplace. So we see a continuum on legal departments and the way they're thinking and the way they're behaving and the way they're acting in response to a lot of the things Ron put up on the market. If you begin to think about it, businesses exist in an increasingly complicated world, right? They exist in a highly competitive market. They exist in a, a global market. They're managing risk in a very material way. Most in-house counsel are trying to raise their strategic value into their organizations, as well as handling the operational pieces. And every legal department has operational things that need to get done and need to get done well. Right, so they're existing in a complicated. And at the same time, to Ron's point, even though they're trying to demonstrate their ROI, they're viewed as a cost center to the business. So the amount of resources devoted to legal departments is getting tighter and tighter. Yes, the spend is going up, but it's not going up in the same ratio as the growth, typically, of large companies. Okay? So their demands are higher, and the resources they have to spend are less. So how are they responding to this? And we see it as essentially a stair step. Okay? And this isn't a perfect model. Companies fall in different spots. and. You know, everybody is unique. 
But there's a call and response here. Um, and I think one of the reasons you're seeing the, the, a lot of law firm leaders saying clients aren't asking for it is that the maturity of the transformation of legal departments is proceeding apace but has not accelerated up the stair steps. So what do I mean by that? If you look at the bottom two, all of these are things we're seeing in the market. If you look at the bottom two, more for less in convergence, this has been around now for a fair amount of time in the market. More for less tends to the call and response. They tend to use procurement. They're using alternative fee arrangements. They're trying to drive efficiencies through process optimization. Convergence, where they're consolidating their legal patterns, they're trying to drive efficiency through volume and through reducing. These are price plates, OK? This is a way of trying to get legal services delivered at a lower price point. And if you begin to think about it, those two models don't require enormous change in the way a law firm operates. Yeah, it puts pressure on hourly rates. Okay? And certainly back in the good old days, back in the golden days, which I wish I'd known they were golden days at the time, back in the you know, 2001 through sort of 2006 time period, law firms made their money simply by raising rates, never bothering to raise value, never bothering to get better at what they're doing, just charging more for it. Yes, we feel pressure in the industry. But it doesn't require fundamental changes in our business model. And so you see law firms out there looking at things like consolidating their expense side, you know, putting their work in a, in a lower cost price center, raising the ratios of, of secretaries to uh, attorneys, doing the price control pieces. It gets more interesting, though, as you begin to think about the next steps that we're beginning to see and have seen, I guess, for a little bit of time, law departments begin to execute on. Unbundling, disaggregation, whatever you want to call it, is sort of the next step. This is really a response to now the increasing multiplicity of alternative legal providers out there, the axioms of the world, the ravels of the world, the legal zooms of the world, the uh, lex machinas of the world, et cetera, et cetera. You're beginning to see, as they're looking to disaggregate services, people beginning to, beginning to fill those gaps. And you see beginning to put pressure on the law firm model to which most law firms are not responding. Okay? They see it, they understand it, but they're not feeling it as change. The trend now is now as we're moving to make or buy. Now law, now law departments, particularly a lot of them, are beginning now to say, OK, we disaggregated our work. We're now beginning to make, make selection decisions based on what we ought to provide in-house, what we're going to send outside in a disaggregated buying environment. This is a pretty significant chance. Now, you know, I'm old enough to have seen a number of cycles. I remember this back from a number of years ago, and, and there are tend to be company politics and trend lines that affect this make or buy decision. Uh, and it, it tends to be a bit cyclical. But what you're seeing, I think, is a pretty significant change in the way law departments are thinking about how they're staffing and driving matters. I agree 100% with what Ron, Ron and Thomas have concluded. And I'm glad they concluded there still remains a future for big law. So that's, thanks for that, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, there is. But we're seeing now a fundamental shift in the way law departments are thinking about it. This will, in my judgment, begin to require law firms to think differently about how they're staffing and driving efficiencies to meet this channel. The cool part, though, is what the really sophisticated buyers of legal services are doing is they're remixing the work. OK, so think about this for a minute. You need to begin thinking about this as a legal supply chain. Okay? It's not just disaggregated pieces. Okay? You need to think about it as, as a consistent chain of legal services value delivery. And the ability to remix, the ability to put those things together, is sort of the critical final step in redesigning how you deliver legal services. And by deliver legal services, I'm not talking exclusively about big law delivering to an in-house legal department. 
I am talking about the combined resources of alternative legal providers, big law firms, small law firms, in-house counsel, to the consumer of legal services. This remixing is, to me, the critical last step. And it requires, in my judgment, a pretty fundamental rethinking of how we deliver legal resources using process, using people, using technology platforms, using those particular points. We've not seen a lot of companies. We've seen some get to this final step. We haven't seen a lot of them. As we see companies move along this line to a greater and greater extent, and I believe they will, the pressure that Ron talks about on the fundamental business model of, of law firms, yes, there's protectionism, and yes, there's some underlying economic reasons why the model works, and yes, dear Lord, we're dealing with lawyers and getting them to change is, you all are, I'm sure, going to be different, but oh my God, uh, it's something to behold, okay? So they're built in barriers to the type of change and speed of adoption curve that we would see in other industries. But having said that, as we move to uh, more of a remix environment, we're clearly going to see more of a demand for people thinking differently, for thinking about the business differently. And we tend to focus a lot on technology and technology solutions. Okay? And they're cool. Okay? Ravel's very cool. Okay? I love what Lex Machina is doing. Okay? And you've all got securities litigation project here at Stanford that's really cool. Okay? But the crux of all of this is thinking about it as a process. Thinking about this legal supply chain as an end-to-end -end process that can be designed and redesigned to drive the outcomes, the efficiencies, the effectiveness that the underlying consumer needs for the business. And there's a role for technology. Okay? I'm as entranced with AI as anybody else, and you know, I hang with the Watson guys, and it's all really cool, and I'm sure one day we're going to be sitting in your office, and the voice is going to come over, and it's going to say, you know, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. Right? Oh, come on. Some, come on. You got to give me something on that. Come, somebody seen. Uh, you're all too. You're all. God, I need more people my age in this room. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> but we're not there yet. Uh, we view technology as an enabler, we view technology as a part and parcel to make people better, more efficient, faster, um, and more effective. And it's all tied together in our judgment with process and rethinking the process engineer, the redesign of the services. Because if you think about it, this legal supply chain is a process, okay, right? And by process, I mean the choreographed nature of the delivery of art. Yes, there's moments where the, this inspiration, this spark, this magic that happens with great lawyers needs to happen and it needs to be recognized, and it needs to be celebrated. And yes, in a for-profit organization, it needs to be paid for. Um, but it's part of an overall process of delivery. And as we remix services and we think about it as a process, it gives us the ability to begin to put pieces back together. And for law firms that are able to play in that environment and shift their thinking and to be able to adopt a way of delivering services in a, in, in a new design set, I think there's tremendous opportunity, tremendous potential. But you're going to see firms not be able to adapt that for a whole bunch of reasons we can talk about if it's at all interesting. So um, anyway, that's sort of what we see out there. Um, Ron talked a little bit about big data. I'll just touch on that a little bit, and his paper did anyway. Um, went too fast there. Yeah, we got big data problems, uh, but they're not big data problems. They're big data problems. I call it little big data. Little big data, absolutely. You'll <laughs> see up here, there you go, small data, right? Um, you know, yeah, we may get the big data, these pools of data that are out there that we can, we can manage and we can look for trends, we can do predictive analytics on, uh, but, but the legal industry is so far behind. Part of it is resource allocation into legal departments. Part of it is just the dinosaur effect of lawyers as a typical. We need to solve this problem. And our advice to clients is let's start counting stuff. 
you know, if it's important, you start counting it. Cycle time may matter. So let's start counting cycle time, okay? And begin to measure and begin to develop metrics. As you do that over time, you can come up with metrics and analyses that both evaluate the quality and effectiveness of the work, measured against outcomes required by the client, but you can also move into more interesting stuff, the predictive analytics, the type of data that can allow you to anticipate and avoid problems. So we see all kinds of interesting stuff. Some firms are going to adapt to it, and I like the use of, a, of your terminology, disruptive scares lawyers, right? So we don't go there. Uh, but as we adapt and as we modify, I think we're on the brink of a different way of doing business. And I think some firms will succeed, some firms will be successful, and some firms are going are to struggle to keep, to keep up. So with that, Ron, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, well, also, for you guys' questions, I, I have questions that I want to ask that might be of interest, but please, like this, it's discussion period. So if, and I don't know, do we need Mike? Uh, pass around. Can you give me an example of your next idea? Sure. Um, well, if you begin to think about, you can think about the, I think there are three dimensions you can think about, OK? There are people, and we tend to forget the people in this. People tend to be, though, not just lawyers. And there's a whole, there's a whole dynamic out there in this market that's probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about in terms of the pool of talented people who can be quality lawyers. It's not just the path it used to be. There's people re-entering the workforce, people who want different structures. There's a whole different world. There's a whole flexibility that's been offered. It's also process engineers, project managers, legal technologies. It's a, it, it, it's a hybrid world. So that's one piece. Another piece is technology. So there are all kinds of different technologies out there that allow you to do particular pieces. So, and it's process, as I said, that holds it all together. So as we look at, as we look at Remix, there, there may be a, let's take contract administration as an example, because it's a typical pain point by companies, okay? A, they're not able to show the value to their business, so a lot of contract development and man, administration falls outside of the legal department because the businesses don't have anything to do with the lawyers. Oh, they're just going to hold us up, but it's going to be bad. Um, they don't know necessarily what their contracts are, so you think about what's the problem here. You can begin to identify a problem set. You then can pull it apart and say, okay, here are the tools. Here are the people at various tranches. Here's the definition of workflow, the process, right? There's high tier work. There's sort of um, uh, work that's maybe core, but not critical to the organization. Then there's stuff, you know, NDAs just need to be done. They need to be right. So you begin putting the pieces back together. You can use a technology set to begin to manage and triage the work and, and automate the process flow. You can begin to talk about, okay, who ought to be handling the work at particular periods of time? Where should it go? What is their job? What's the expectation? As you begin to look at it as a process, putting the work back together then requires not losing the efficiencies you're trying to draw by reassembling the work because there's friction in the handoffs, there's inefficiency in the movement of information between people. So it's about redesigning the system so that you're maintaining those efficiencies and you're hitting the right quality levels at the various points that you need to hit. Do you have to get an NDA perfect? Does it have to be ready to sus sustain scrutiny at the Supreme Court? No, oh, nobody forces those things. They just need to be done, right? The billion dollar joint venture deal needs to be done right, needs to be done well. But as Ron pointed out, you want that done as efficiently and effectively as you possibly can as well. So it's about manipulating those dimensions and putting them back together. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but you know, close from, enough. Okay, I'll take close enough. From the design perspective, I think the, the, a common question is, if you didn't have an existing system and you started from scratch and you looked at the problems that were there would you design it the way, I mean, that's a common question now going to big law. Is that the way you would structure the firm? Normally the answer is no, that we wouldn't do it this way. Getting to what you might design if you started from scratch, right, from where you are now, because it's, it's right, the car with the turning wheel that you're trying to change is, can be a challenge. So, um, let me see, I, I wanted to ask why, has Cyfarth embraced innovation? So part of the issue, if we look at some of the barriers, has to do with 
uh, innovation is hurting the billable hour. It might cut in. You're, you're, you're looking at lower margin work potentially. Why did they pick you to do this, and why are they on board? And so, like, how do other firms rally the troops, or should they even bother? Well, you're asking a bunch of questions in well, there, I mean, Rod. If I, to, if, I mean, I, if I were taking a deposition, I'd say, which question do you want me to answer? All of them. Why are you doing this? Why, why are we doing why it? Was, why is the culture amenable to it? And what lessons should be learned from other law sure. firms? How long does it take to come up to speed on this stuff for a law firm to make these changes, et cetera? That's just one question. OK. <laughs> um, I don't know is the answer to last one. We've only been at it 10 years when we get to the end of the done. journey. Or yeah, when we get okay. to the end journey, I'll let you know. Um, and the easiest way to answer that is, I think, to describe both the, the, the start of the journey and some of the both the barriers and the advantages that we had going into it. Uh, the, the, the story behind the, the, the start of the journey is, is, is a fairly simple one where, as I said, we were, I, I, I became chair of the firm in 2001, uh, in the summer of 2001. And putting aside the, the sort of entry point, uh, the economy was going well, the business was going well. It was, as I said, in sort of the 2002 to 2006 period, it was, um, in some sense, the golden age of law firms. Um, and you would go to the pundits, and they talk about, oh, all these levers of profitability, the only one you're pulling are the rates. You know, kudos, that's great. And, and, and I certainly began to develop this, this core belief that there had to be a better way. There had to be a better way to do services. How sustainable could that business model possibly be? And it turns out it's more sustainable than I would have guessed. Um, <laughs> But how sustainable is it? Why is it that our industry is relatively immune from the variables that affect virtually every other business? Every other business has to get better and faster, right? Why don't lawyers have to get better and faster? And there's some of it always that's going on. Computerized research is different, as I said, than why I used to trek to the books. But why aren't, so we came up with the belief that there had to be a better way. And a, and a couple of things, facilitated that change in our environment. One, our firm has always had a culture of looking um, outside in. Our firm has always had a culture of trying to do things a little bit differently. We were founded by you know, three guys that, that started in a practice area that didn't even exist at the time they started the firm. So that we had some cultural support for what we were trying to do, which I think is absolutely critical. Um, we, we also recognized that we were embarking on a change journey, and change of lawyers is difficult. And, um, you know, we made a lot of missteps along the way, but it's, it's been a journey for us. It's been a learning expedition for us. Um, we started by trying to explain, and we use not just my voice, but we use voices of Tom Sager from DuPont came in and talked to us. Tom, as you may know, was using Six Sigma. Sort of, he sort of pioneered the use of Six Sigma in a legal environment when he was at DuPont before he was general counsel. We used other voices. The challenge was to build the business case. Um, the challenge was to help our teammates understand that we needed to find a better way for our clients. And one of the important inflection points for us was the recognition that we were trying to find a better way for our clients. Okay? This, 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 we heard all of the things. Oh, my God, you're trying to make us the McDonald's of law firms. You're moving us into commodity work. You know, you're going to take away, if the client will pay, you know, $600 an hour for this work, why are we finding a way to give it to them for a lower price point? And we had to develop answers to all that. And the answer to the last one is, at some point, the market's going to wake up, and they're not going to keep doing this. They're not going to keep there someday they're going to take work in house, and we're able to use some examples from our own history where we'd seen that happen. So it took time to begin to build uh, a different way of of of, evo of of thinking about the business, and we started pretty simply. We started from trying to drive efficiency and trying to use lean six segment process and trying to drive inefficiencies out of the business, and we, we we've over the years moved to a more um, I'm, I'm, I see Margaret sitting over there, and I know I'm going to use the term. I'm going to use a, a term of art, and I don't mean it in quite the right way, but to a more design-centered way of thinking about the business. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Where we're, we're trying to look at delivery systems to our client base from their perspective, from using data, using process, 
Uh, and, and, and can I tell you, Ron, that every, you know, we've got 800 lawyers. Can I tell you that all 800 are sitting there doing process engineering and, 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 and have, have felt a life-changing moment? No, no. Um, Only half of them? <laughs> Epiphanies. I, I, the epiphanies are rare in this particular business. I think more, you know, the, the vast bulk of our lawyers understand the path we're on. They understand why we're on it. They may not have the depth of understanding yet to be able to redesign processes or systems, mm -hmm. but they, they, you know, look, lawyers are a, lawyers are a competitive breed. So, you know, frankly, the fact that we win awards a lot matters. It helps give us credibility. The fact that we've had client voices or the Richard Suskins of the world come in and talk to us about what's going on in the market matters to the team. Um, and so we, we try to bring them along. You gotta meet people where they are, right? And so you've gotta find their place and you gotta move them forward. And everybody moves at a slightly different pace. Um, and I don't actually think there's an end point. I, I don't actually think there's a moment where you you know, hang up the banner on the ship and declare mission accomplished. So you haven't given up on partner profitability? Our, our partner profitability in the last four years has grown something like 25% uh, when, the, when the average is, is far less than that. Does that mean that you're going to start measuring productivity by the work product per hour instead We're, of by number of hours billed? Um, the answer is one would hope so. We're, we're start, well, we're starting to do that in certain in certain sectors of our business, particularly where we can move away from hourly-based billing. And let's be honest, the market still is largely around hourly-based billing. But for example, one of our, one of our business units is handling um, ERISA cases um, for some of our insurers. Right? And we have teams that are not evaluated on the hourly, they're evaluated by caseload and cycle time and quality of results versus the predicted outcome. Um, and you can do that in certain sectors of the business. It gets much more difficult to do that in a lot of the pieces of business where the billable hour is the predominant method for measuring and rewarding well, more, product clients. More for less means also more, more product per hour, even if you're doing billable. And, 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 and there's no question about that. And one of our, one of our markers, particularly for associates, our efficiency yep. measures, okay. absolutely. Um, but let's also be honest, the, the, the measurement by the hour um, pushes against that. You've got it, it, it's an inhibiting factor to driving efficiency in the market. There's a question. No, the only reason we ask about mics is just because we want it on the recording, but we'll repeat the question. So go ahead. All right. Um, my question is: We're talking a lot about products and services. We have to introduce into the legal field that would be helpful. Um, for you and running your firm, is there like a particular product or a business that if you had a magic Uh, the question is, if I've had a magic wand, what would be the product or service that I would create? Yes. Um, it's a great question. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you two answers to that. One is uh, some magic potion to make sure every, so that everybody would take and they would see life the same way I see it. That would be really cool. <laughs> um, but I don't know that that's out there. Um, you know, I think the... There's really interesting technology development around, I think AI may be overstating it, but around uh, you know, natural language, around some of, the, some of the things that technology can do to speed the delivery of legal services. And if I had a magic wand, I'd leap us forward about five years to bring some of that technology forward to really speed it. But the true answer to your question is, there's not really a magic wand. There's not really a thing out there because it, it, it's a, the delivery of legal services is a complicated process. And it involves humans, and it involves technology, and it involves business units. And you, you, you have to look at it holistically, and you have to look at it in the various pieces. And it's messy, and it's because you got people, and particularly because the people are lawyers. Yeah, you know. Um, and, and so there's no, there's no one thing I think you can point to. It's a lot of things you've got to put together. So I want to further yeah, that I a little he, bit. And I'll, let me get one. Do you, I mean, we've talked about whether or not law firms have any IP. Generally speaking, the answer is they don't, right? It's all in the heads. Of, and I'm wondering, at what point will we see more APIs 
into the law firm where you're taking the expertise in your lawyers, you're putting it in some sort of a database type structure, and you're allowing your clients to simply query that rather than having to go to the thousand dollar an hour lawyer. That's just, you're still capturing all the right. expertise that you need. You're simply amplifying the work of the lawyer to the degree right. that you're able to do that. Uh, we, we, do, we do some of that now. Okay. Um, we, we try to capture on the advice side, capture it in searchable databases and access to our clients through, through we've got proprietarily developed technology. Through that particular technology, we also have uh, using third party software. Um, um, it's not artificial intelligence. It's essentially automated decision tree. Mm -hmm. uh, expert system. Expert system uh, where people can come in and they can move along the line. So we're, we're, we're trying to scale out the knowledge yeah. of people using technology in a far more robust way. There was a, you had a question, please. What characteristics and skills are you looking for in people that you're bringing in to build your team you know, now to maintain your ego where you want to go? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the question is what skills um, and mindsets are we looking for uh, for people coming in to help us build? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start, I think I'll, I'll, I can answer it this way, which is you, you always start from the premise that you need excellent lawyers. You need people who are really, really first class skilled lawyers. Um, that's a foundation off of which everything builds. Uh, you want people, we've got very clear core values in our organization built around our clients, built around innovation, built around collaboration, built around commitment. Um, you want people who have those values, who share that mindset. But then you want people who are willing to think differently, willing to, 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 to be open-minded. We don't need them to come with the mindset of how you manipulate these dimensions, but we want them to be, want them to recognize that there has to be a better way. Uh, and we get a lot of people who come to us that, that, that you know, sort of know what we're doing and, and, and want to learn more about it and find a better way. Mark? I have a question. Um, so obviously the legal industry is quite competitive. How does Sidebar think about how much it shares with, like, outside of its own walls um, to kind of put the industry forward and kind of set those new metrics, set those new standards of what good kind of that remix of practice looks like without kind of giving away everything you've invested? Yeah, the question is, how much do we share what we're doing uh, in a competitive marketplace? And at the beginning, we kind of worried a lot more about that, frankly, than we do now. Um, uh, because the market is changing so quickly, we've realized that it's, a, that it's a very difficult path to go down. And so while we don't share a particular process map, or we're not going to give anybody the code to uh, you know, some of our proprietary technology, you know, at the same time, I think we feel an obligation to share our experiences, to share um, where what we've done, what we've learned. Um, you know, I published some essays on Medium.com trying to talk about that uh, experience. We're trying to do more thought leadership. Um, I think that we feel an obligation to try to give back to the industry. What people do with it, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we've learned a lot over 10 years, and we're more than happy to share what we've learned. It's, it's not the worst marketing message to say to your clients that you measure performance based on work product per hour rather than number of hours built. It's not, and <coughs> we, we hope it helps them get away from measuring us based on the number of hours yeah. built. Um, do you – I know you said something about incentivizing efficiency as some of the performance. Can you speak to whether or not there's any other – like, how do you – fund R&D, <clears throat> do you have issues with your partners in terms of embracing a certain amount of giving back towards the development of research development, or is that really different there? What, or yeah. So the last part of this, because I, I yeah. do these multi-part questions, apparently. The percentage of budget, typically, that's going to R&D is, I think, with law firms, some like marketing budget is 3%, R&D maybe 1%. Do you just say that? Anything? sounds about right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a question that comes off of that. So we just saw in the news this morning, Denny's has started the subsidiary innovation lab. And part of Christensen's um, framework is that the incumbents cannot innovate internally. They kind of have to do it outside of themselves in terms of what entities are putting out. And it kind of goes into Ron's question, too. Right? So, so 
in terms of how you guys are looking at our data, <coughs> kind of what you think of this new endeavor by the entrance. Sure, set me up. <laughs> um, let me talk about R&D first. We're tag teaming. Uh, you're tag teaming, oh my god. Um, yeah, R&D is a challenging thing in, in, a, in a law firm environment because you're a cash-based business, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're constantly balancing the expense side of the equation versus the revenue side of the equation, trying to make sure that the owners of the business are achieving a return on their particular investment, both in any current year. I mean, uh, I'm blessed to work in a firm that has historically taken the long view of things and been willing to invest. That's one of, one of, the, one of the core cultural attributes that we have. Yeah. Um, but still, we're constantly measuring. One of the things that you talked about, the protectionism of the unauthorized practice of law statutes, you know, I, I guess I would just add a couple of sort of perspectives on that, which is I, I get the protect, protectionism. But I think it's a false sense of security for the, for the legal industry, both because the, the definition of what the practice of law is is, is is hardly crystal clear. LegalZoom, Axiom, some of the big four are doing things that I might call the practice of law, and yet they're growing dramatically. Uh, but it also makes capital flows into R&D much more difficult. You can't take outside investment. You can't. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons I suspect Denton's has spun off the business because they can have the ability to take outside investment because it's probably not the practice of law. Um, so you're constantly measuring that. I, I wish we had more capital to invest mm -hmm. in R&D. I think we'd be moving forward. Um, you know, our Cypher Clean Consulting subsidiary has about 35 people in it now. Uh, and part of their function is an R&D mm -hmm. function for us, trying to run around business discipline, trying to run around essentially uh, an accelerator concept. Uh, for us, uh, as well as consulted with the business, so there to be revenue generators as well. Uh, in terms of the Denton's question, um, I only know the link you sent me, so I don't know anything about it. Um, I um, copying is a form of compliment. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see where that behemoth goes with it. I think. The prospect of Denton's fundamentally changing their business model or doing something different strikes me as almost impossible with, what, 5,000 lawyers, 6,000 lawyers in a variety structure where no one part is accountable to the other part. I could be wrong. Um, but, you know, in their world, they've got a lot of capital because of the size, and I presume they've set it up separately. Take, it sounds like they're, they're looking to take ex, outside capital. And I presume that they're, they're looking for a return on that investment over time, looking to develop products that they in turn can monetize and bring to market, I presume. I saw the same news clip you did. I don't know anything more about it. The Thomas, oh. Go ahead. The software industry has embraced project management. So, for example, Agile, that's a way to manage projects. And they've all, I haven't seen that for the most part. Why not? Um, we use Agile project management. We use Kanban boards. We use all that kind of stuff. I think the, there's, a, there's a decision point that where the industry went one way, we actually went another way. Uh, the industry um, sort of made a decision, let's train all of our lawyers to be project managers. Um, and I, I can tell you sort of how that happened in the old Brad Hildebrandt taking ideas from us and yeah, Brad, God love it. Um, I always thought that was a mistake uh, because I think you're trying to boil the ocean. Project management is a profession. It is a skill set. And so um, we built um, what I believe to be the largest group of legal project managers, certainly in the, in the country. And they use all of these skill sets. Uh, and part of the reason why it's difficult for lawyers You've got all kinds of reasons. One, our minds don't always work that way. Two, language matters to look. And for project managers, they managers, they speak in a different language. They talk about things. They use things. And when lawyers get involved in that, they start hearing all these words and they go, "Oh my God, I mean, that sounds stupid, right?" And they and, and and they turn off for that. So you've got to translate that bit for lawyers. Uh, I think the, the the various techniques that they use are perfectly adapted 
to the delivery of legal services. In fact, for us, it's a critical component for how we manage complex matters, streams of matters, flows of matters. Absolutely. Uh, from, as a software engineer, uh, when I have been talk, I've spoken with a few firms about their own software development. And this is not just project management, it's just overall. One of the issues, I, I have to blog about this because I keep meaning to, I just don't think that law firms are the best place to develop software. Yes, that's a given, but they don't necessarily know that. The issue, there's a couple of issues, and one of them has to do with the, the infrastructure around the software development that includes testing and a lot of stuff, engineering work for, for design issues. They don't get it. They don't know that they don't get it, it's, but it's a problem. But um, another issue is who they're willing to sell to, and it's just kind of inappropriate to develop a bunch of software at one law firm and think that you're going to sell to your competitors. That this, or if, if, or they don't. They want to use it as a strategic advantage for com competitively, but that doesn't work because you can't sell to the market. So, <clears throat> for me, a lot of the issue is recognizing that the, the startups are a really good place to develop a lot of this stuff. And we see, you know, like Allegory is somebody out of Gibson done, had been a litigator for years, then went and started doing litigation support software, and is now selling it across the market. She has all of the experience. She's working with the engineers and all that. But it's just that the, to not just sell to the one firm because you don't get the revenue that you want when you're selling across the firm. So you had one question. I think we've got to stop. But after, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, as a, uh, as a purchaser of law graduates, what do you think law schools <laughs> and students should be doing differently? Um, well, that's something we'll be talking about this afternoon. Um, I think a couple of things. I think that it's, it, it's a different world now than when I started. When I started, it was enough to just be a technically great lawyer and work came to you. I think there are mindset changes that we need to be successful now. Uh, Bill Henderson from Indiana refers to it as legal integrators, right? The ability to put these pieces together to look more broadly. So some of the skill sets are the setting our egos aside. And I, I, I know nobody from Stanford has an ego. I know that. But I went to Virginia and we had huge egos when we graduated, right? Um, we live now in a world, a multidisciplinary world, where we have professionals working with us who have degrees other than law degrees, and they bring tremendous value to us. So opening up our minds to be able to work with those skill sets to adapt, to be willing to think about process, to be willing to think about these things, to learn you know, from them. It's not what you learn at law school, it's what you learn uh, in the practice. And I think there's enormous opportunities. Um, you know, I, I have a daughter who's a second-year lawyer, right? And I'm proud of her being a second-year lawyer because I think there's tremendously interesting things this industry is going through and can become and will become over the years if we're willing to think different, if we're willing to approach the business differently and get our, get our noses out of the books, recognizing that our clients have outcomes they need to be delivered and think differently about it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay. you. Thank you.